So good morning. Uh, welcome to the electrical workflow for CPC Suite Tools webinar. Uh, it's 10.30 PST, so we're going to get going. Uh, the intention of today's webcast is to show you the, the tools within the CTC Suites that give you the easiest bang for your buck as an electrical engineer. So utilizing Revit for design and documentation. So we're not going to be covering all of the tools, uh, but there are uh, some tools which will be of definite value to you uh, most of your office, and I've tried to pick a few of those to show you case today. Uh, so they're going to highlight some of the typical things you'll come up against uh, day to day with Revit and electrical engineering or electrical design. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I'm going to introduce my colleague uh, Mugis Altaf. He's the account manager for the CTC range of products, and he will have a few things to talk about in a moment. Uh, my name is Drew Jarvis. I'm a technical consultant at SolidCAD. I've been lucky enough to be uh, introducing BIM to companies across Canada for the last 15 to 20 years. And um, in the last few years, we've uh, partnered with CTC and found they've got some really fabulous tools uh, that were going to help you understand a little bit more for your automation. So I'll uh, pass things over to Mudis. Hello to everyone um, in the attendance. Uh, my name is Maurice, as Drew mentioned. Uh, I'm a CTC productivity specialist with SolidCAD. And what that means is that I focus heavily on the CTC part of the business at SolidCAD. Uh, but before we get into the CTC, um, I wanted to, uh, you know, sort of introduce SolidCAD as a company and tell you guys about um, tell all of you about our offerings and what we offer and the services that we provide. And so we partner with Autodesk and various different software uh, developing companies. Um, and we sell software. Um, and beyond that, we service um, in the AEC and, and, and uh, civil infrastructure um, and the manufacturing um, industries. Some of our uh, services that we do offer are a BIM consulting um, training um, that um, uh, you know, goes on on a daily basis, on a regular basis, events that we host uh, with locally and all over Canada. Um, there's also uh, customization and software development that we do in-house at SolidCAD and various different services. We also have multiple offices all across Canada uh, for your needs. So we have um, sales reps and uh, technical support available all across Canada with 15 offices and 12 training facilities. And solid assist technical support is something that we offer to all of our clients um, and it includes in your uh, subscription with us. These are some of the partner products um, that we resell, uh, you know, and today we'll actually focus on CTC, CTC being um, the automation tool within Revit, uh, providing a lot of productivity to for the end user and for the BIM management team. Um, as Drew mentioned, today we'll have a focus on um, the electrical portion of um, uh, CTC and of Revit in general. Drew, I'll pass this on to you and maybe if you can uh, just uh, give an overview about the suites and move on to the electrical portion of uh, today's topic. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, so today we'll be looking at tools from the CTC Express. Uh, so this includes a bunch of different uh, suites. So you can see here the BIM Project Suite, BIM Manager Suite, BIM Batch Suite. Um, so they're the ones we'll be focusing on today. Um, we won't um, specifically be looking into Hive or the Mechanical Electrical Plumbing Productivity Pack, but definitely those are other tools that I would recommend uh, taking a look at, finding out what they're about. Uh, the Hive is a content management solution, and with the, the MEP Cubed, you're going to get a lot of great content there for uh, those that are starting up to use Revit for electrical design and documentation. 
I do have a few slides to go through uh, once I've been through and kind of given you an overview of what we're looking at and then going to open up Webit Live as well. So a bit of a combination of the two. Um, first of all, just a, a quick uh, thing about learning objectives. We're going to take a look at identifying the three, the three versus the license tools that uh, you have available. Um, we'll have a look at some of the popular tools for electrical workflow. And then I'm also going to uh, show you that you can get hold of the suite and the tools uh, very easily. So note that on each of the ribbons, so you can see an image there, um, the tool panels show uh, on the screen right now have either light or dark tools, the icons, I should say. So where we've got the, the purple one there, we've got the family exporter and the family loader has been the free tools. So they're going to be available to you during the 14-day trial, but also after that 14-day trial. No license required to use all of those. So there's, there's, there's a dozen or so tools available there for free. The darker icon tools, they're available for 14 days as a trial. And then after that, you would need a, a license of the suite in order to run them. So you see the BIM batch suite, the BIM manager suite, and then the BIM project suite. Just as a bit of focus for them, the BIM project suite would typically be the one you would give out to all of your users within a company. The BIM manager and the BIM batch suite might be something where you need one or two or three licenses across the firm that are shared just to you know, one per office type of uh, uh, thing. So we can help you with deciding uh, appropriate numbers of licenses uh, for your particular needs. So really jumping straight in to look at some of the tools. The first one is the, the view creator. So this tool is going to assist you with the creation of views in your projects. Um, so let's say a, a typical electrical project, you might have uh, lighting, small power, uh, fire protection, um, different types of uh, view. You then have multiple levels within the project. And so once you take you know, a 10 story building with your four different um, types of view, then you've got your 40 different views that you need to create. And I'm sure you'll have found if you tried this manually, in order to do that, uh, you have to remember to set the right uh, view template. You've got to make sure you've named the view correctly. You might have view types that could be other settings you have to go into. There's, there's a lot of uh, manual work that goes into that and manual work can often lead to error. So the view creator is going to take those view templates. So it is focused on the, uh, the presence of view templates inside of your Revit project template, and it's going to assist you with view creation. So I will open it up and show you that uh, shortly. Uh, but that's just uh, one of the first tools we're going to take a look at. And the second one is the invisibility advisor, which if, um, if you remember when you first started with Revit, the big challenge getting going with Revit was where the heck is the object that I'm looking for? If you came from a CAD background, there were two ways you couldn't see an object in CAD. The layer was off or the layer was frozen. Revit has apparently nearly 60 different ways in which the object can be invisible. I could probably name about 30 of them. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of different ways that you can lose your object. And so I used to find after we, you know, back when we used to do a lot of fundamentals training in Revit, after that, uh, that four day class, I would get a phone call or an email the next week from the attendees of the class saying, I, I can't find this object. I know I've made it. I, I, I can see it in this view, but I can't see it in this other view. Yeah, please help me. Um, so the invisibility advisor is actually a tool that works just like that. We're going to show it an element that we know is in the model. We're going to give it the name of a view that we can't see it in. And it's going to go and find the, the reason why it's hidden inside of that. So, you know, maybe it's the categories turned off. Maybe there's a filter. Maybe it's just a uh, hide in view. Uh, maybe it's discipline specific. There's, there's numerous reasons and uh, the invisibility advisor is going to assist you with finding that reason. Uh, the next one is actually a free tool. So even if you don't buy the license, you've got no excuse to not download the tools and make use of this one. So this is the project cleaner. You can see there's a bunch of tabs inside of the image there showing views, templates, filters, sheets, links, imports, and images. Essentially, if you consider when you receive a file and you're going to use it as a link inside of yours, so it's from another consultant and it's going to be a linked model, half of that file the file size could be taken up with non-model data. 
So that's all the information about the view, the different view settings. It's all the annotations in the views. Um, it's all the different families that could have been purged out and things like this. And that takes time if you want to do that. So you could have a standard in place where you do clean up every file that comes in. If you get a new file every week for four different consultants in that project, you gotta you know, clean up four files every week. It's gonna take time. The project cleaner automates it for you. So on the screen right now, it shows the imports. You can see a bunch of DWGs with a count of how many there are inside the project. It'll find those and take them out for you. It also works the other way, right? If you're sending your files out to your consultants and you wanna clean up the model and just send them the model data, this is the tool that's gonna to do that for you. And again, it's free. Now this next one, not only has a great name, it's the Parameter Jammer, um, but it serves a great purpose. Um, one of the challenges I find that people have when they're getting going with Revit in electrical use is getting their schedules to really work. Schedules are kind of that low hanging fruit that you think, well, I'm using Revit, I've got data in my model, I should be able to auto generate these schedules. But sometimes they can be a challenge to get going with. One of the challenges with them is getting your parameters onto the families. So if you download manufacturer content, you'll find you load it into your project and it looks great, but getting it to load up into your schedule with perhaps a bunch of shared parameters, it's not gonna work. So you have to go to the family and you have to add singularly each shared parameter to the family and then load that family back into your project and then it should work. But you, know, you could have 15 different parameters that you need to have loaded into each family way too time consuming. The parameter jammer comes in, you tell it which schedule is working, which family isn't working, point it at your shared parameter file and let it do the rest. So it puts the shared parameters into the family for you. You can even map it to data. So let's say you have a certain uh, schedule for the, uh, sorry, a certain column in your schedule for voltage and the family already has a voltage parameter in it, but it isn't the right one for your schedule where you can map it so that it's gonna read the data that's existing on the family and copy it into the correct parameter that you add from your shared parameter file. I promise it's a, it's a fantastic tool. This one is a real time saver and it will get things working inside of your standards. Then the final one I'm gonna open up is the project processor. So model health is very important with Revit. You wanna make sure that you're uh, keeping your file kind of lean you want to make sure you get rid of any rubbish that comes in, any garbage that's been put in there. Uh, for example, if you were to bring a CAD file in, I'm sure you're aware text types come in, field region uh, types come in, uh, line patterns. There's all these different little things that get left in your model. The project processor will enable you to swap those to the correct type, clean away the bad ones, and a whole, whole bunch more. Not only does it work on one file, but you can set it up to batch run on multiple files. So if you're the BIM manager in your office and your job is to keep the files performing at 100%, this is a tool that you're gonna to be able to run once a week on all your projects that are currently active and make sure that they're keeping nice and clean. Okay. So I'm gonna switch over into the live demo now. So wish me luck, uh, this is the, the fun part, <laughs> we should see. So, uh, I just wanted to confirm with you, uh, shall we take take questions as um, you go on or should we reserve questions till the end of the webinar? No, please, yeah, if you have questions, uh, feel free to put them into the Q&A box. Um, if I, I'll try and keep them on the screen so I can see them and I'll try and answer them as I go along. Absolutely fine to, uh, to try and address questions. Just um, if I'm missing Perfect. a bunch of them, just let me know. Just shout at me and I'll, I'll get, on, get on to them. Awesome. Okay. So first off, then, uh, we've got the, the view creator. So on the screen right now, I think I'm sharing it, yep. <laughs> um, we've got me, uh, a model here. This is an electrical model. I can see if I zoom in here, I've got some uh, light fixtures in highlighted in purple here inside of this model. What I don't have at the moment are views. So I've cleaned this one out a little bit. I've deleted all of the views, but it doesn't have to be that clean, but it's just to show you uh, me creating some additional ones. I'm gonna go and go to my CTC software tab on the ribbon here, and you'll see that I've got my three different suites. So here's the BIM batch suite, BIM manager suite, and the BIM project suite. 
to the View Creator as part of the BIM Project Suite. I'm going to go ahead and open up the View Creator tool and I'll get the dialog box. This dialog box is going to show me a bunch of tabs inside of here for different types of views that I can create. So the one I'm going to focus on for now is going to be the plan ceiling. And what you'll notice is that I've got the levels in the project. I can check the ones I want to make views for. And then I've got the view templates. So they're organized just like they are inside of Revit. You've got your ceiling plan view templates or elevation or floor plans. So I'm going to go with the floor plan ones. I've got perhaps my lighting calculation, lighting color fill, lighting plan, power plan. So there's four of them. I'm going to say I want to run this on my new construction phase. So if we had a multi-phase project, you could pick the different phases and create views for those. Again, another time consuming thing. Whenever you set up phases, now you've got you know, twice or three times as many views to create one for each phase. In order to see what it's going to name them, what I'm going to do is take a look down here. We can see I could include a prefix. I've then got the level, so level one, two, three. I've then got the view template. And we can change these around. So if I wanted to include the phase, I could put the phase there and the view template there. You, know, you can move these around. I'm going to go with the, the view template and the phase. And I've actually checked no uh, abbreviation for the phase. So it won't actually show up because I only have the one phase that I'm looking at in this project. If I hit add, it's not creating the views yet. But what it is doing is giving me a chance to just kind of confirm the names. So down here, you can see it's going to make a level one lighting calculation plan, a level one lighting color fill plan, et cetera. So if I go and hit create views, you can see it's made my 12 views. I'll then switch over to ceiling plans, perhaps. I've got my electrical coordination, my lighting ceiling. Uh, those two will do. Confirm the names of those. All oh, looks good. Hit create views. So I haven't got you know a, a 20 story building or a 50 story building here, but they you, you can see how extend this out and you've got a big time saver, um, even on this one. The fact that it's created them and if I now close this down over here inside of my lighting, it doesn't call it level one and then level one brackets one, level one brackets two, level one brackets three, which it would do if I just use the out of the box floor plan tool. Or if I duplicated them, it would have copy one, copy of, or whatever it says after the name. Each of these has a name that is appropriate to that view. They've all been named per properly. And they took hardly any time at all. So if your job in the office is to set up projects, you are fully aware of the challenge of making these views and how much easier it's going to be if you have a simple tool like that. Okay. So the next tool is the invisibility advisor. Now this is a simple one. We've got numerous ways that things can be hidden. And in order to find something that's hidden, you know, you might have a bit of a checklist that you run through. It's just in your head. It's something you've learned over time using Revit. So first of all, you go into your vis uh, visibility graphics and you check, okay, is, is the category turned on that I'm looking for here? If it is, then maybe you go over to your filters and you check, is there a filter? And I know myself, sometimes I've kind of hit remove a bunch of times just to get rid of all the filters and then check if the object comes back. If it comes back, okay, now I can undo and now I can go and look at each of the filters one by one and figure out which one it was. Or maybe, you know, it's, it's the temporary uh, reveal hidden elements thing down here. Or maybe someone's gone in and edited the line work of the object, wherever that tool is, somewhere around here, there's a line work tool, there we go, um, which allows you to set the object to invisible lines. That's always a fun one. So there's numerous reasons why it could be disappeared. In my model here, I've got a real simple one, just for the example. But you can see in this room here, I have one lighting fixture. As I go over to this other view, zoom into the same room, you can see there are two lighting fixtures. And so if I investigate both of these, they're at the same height of 2743.2, okay? Um, so it's not a view range. I, I know that straight away. But there is an object missing here. So I can use my invisibility advisor to, to help find it. Again, over to the CTC software tool. And this is another one of the, the BIM project suite. So this is something you give out to all your users so that they don't come to you with these questions, right? 
go into the invisibility advisor and you've got two things you need to specify you need to specify the object and you need to specify the view it's missing in so right now i can't pick the object because i can't see it that's kind of my purpose <laughs> so here's the object i can see it here i'll select element pick the element and there it finds it so it's this eight foot strip light it's got the element id there if you had the element id you could select it by id you can select a bunch of things with a crossing window, that type of thing. And then it wants to know, well, which view is it not showing in? So it needs to be an open view, an active view. So I've got my 02 missing element. That's my named view there. What I'll do is hit find element, and it's going to run through those 50, 60 different ways that objects can be hidden. And so what we've got down here is object is hidden in view okay let's see the fix on that one so i'm just going to hit the button and it's going to go ahead and actually unhide that object in the view so effectively what it's done is it's identified that this object has been hidden in the view equivalent of me turning on my light bulb down here finding that object has been hidden right clicking on it and unhide in view or unhide in view up here on the on the ribbon there so a simple solution on this particular one but as i say it looks at all the different ways that the objects can be hidden and it finds the solution for you that can be a big time saver especially for things like that view range if you've got a new user and it's their first week using revit they're not going to know i should be going into the view range and putting the view range up closer towards the underside of the slab um you know they're still thinking in cad to be thinking yet okay so anyway great tool did I fix it? I think I did. I think I undid it again as well, didn't I? Let me just uh, turn that off. Is it still hidden? It is. Let me fix it again just to show you. The fix tool's great. You just click it and it it's fixed that, fixes the issue for you. There we go. So that object's showing in the view now. Okay. Jumping over into uh, the next one, and this is one of those free tools. So as mentioned, you've got free tools available here. So you can see a bunch of free tools available inside of the BIM project suite. I've got free tools available inside of the BIM manager suite, as well as the BIM patch suite. So if I go into my BIM manager suite free tools, one of them here is the project cleaner. As I open this one up, it's going to give me different tabs here with all those different things that can be easily cleaned. I don't have any images, but I do have Imports inside of here. I've got two of the section 2.dwg file apparently. I've got a bunch of filters that maybe if I'm just sharing the model, I don't need to see. I'm sure you know by trying to delete views, even that simple thing, in order to delete these, I have to pick each one using the control key. And then I get access to the delete. If I use the shift key from top to bottom, oh, okay, my delete's available now, but sometimes it isn't. <laughs> um, the the easiest way is probably to go into your browser organization and organize it so it's not into separate little folders here um but even that that takes time right so you're going to find that your project cleaner available for free is is a great tool i'm going to expand views and schedules here you can see all these different things well i can just come over to the side click that button i've now picked all of those views in the project it's going to delete them View templates. I don't have any views. Don't need any view templates. Filters. I don't have any views. I don't need any filters. Sheets. It's the same. I'm going to say the same thing. <laughs> uh, links. I don't want to send it with links because then it's just going to take longer for them to open up or they're going to get issues saying it can't find it, whatever it is, or when I'm bringing it in as my background. Same thing with my imports. I'm just picking all of those. And then up the top here, I've got this remove tool. I'm just going to tell me, okay, you're getting rid of 39 views, 11 view templates, all these other things. Great. I like the sound of that. Then it tells me, well, you're in a view. You can't get rid of that one. Okay. We'll leave one there then. Have a look at the project browser. Still got 42 views in there. Now it doesn't. Now it's down to one. I've also removed my links. Everything in there is just now my electrical stuff ready for me to send out. Now, don't do this on a live project. 
open it up to tax from central, save it somewhere else, then run it. That's going to be a better solution than uh, doing this to your live project. But you're going to see here now, I've just got this one view. And we should probably talk to CTC about getting panel schedules included as well, maybe. <laughs> that would be another thing to add into there. So yeah, anytime you're sending a file out and you want to clean it, anytime you're receiving a file, you're going to use it as a background. Save it into a, a link folder, clean it up. Now you can use it as your link. Okay. I keep looking over there, just checking if there's any questions there. Okay, number four. I've got two left. This is a this is the really cool one. This is the parameter jammer. Um, I don't know if I like it because of the name or, or because of how great it is, but uh, if we take a look at the parameter jammer, let's see if I can show you something you're familiar with. Familiar with. So I've got a project here, and down here, I guess I left that as the wrong type. All right. <laughs> at the moment, if I look at my lighting fixture schedule, everything's working. I've got my count, my type, my description. But this schedule, if I look at it in its settings, this type column here, this is actually a parameter called identity type mark. This is a shared parameter. The description is actually a shared parameter. It's the schedule description. So definitely over here, we've got things like the, the lumens down, the vault, the input watts. These are all shared parameters inside of here. And if I, were, if I go and find myself a family from a manufacturer's website that I want to use, when I bring it in, I'll show you what happens with it. So I'm going to go to my view. I'm going to find some of my light fixtures here. I'm going to change them from my content that's working to a manufacturer's family, which looks OK. You know, maybe I, 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 I fiddle around with the graphics of it. but it's now loaded in there, that's all good. But if I go to my lighting fixture schedule, you can see I've now got eight objects here and they don't have a value for some of these things. Now they, they do have manufacturer and model number because those are kind of out of the box parameters. So those are still working. It's these ones here that are shared parameters. So let me just go into the fields again and show you that identity type mark. If I edit it, you'll see it's a, a shared parameter. So how do I fix that without a CTC tool? Well, I have to take the family, edit the family, memorize the name of all the parameters, no problem. <laughs> um, let's go into here and have a look. So I go into my parameters. I have a look down the list because I'm looking for identity type mark, I think it was called. And don't see it. I see type mark, maybe, <laughs> he says. <laughs> Probably. Don't see that right now. Anyway, definitely the thing I'm looking for is not there. So in order to add it, I need to go and create a new parameter. It's going to be a shared parameter. So I go select it. It may or may not be pointing to the right shared parameter file. I might need to go and search for it. I've then got to figure out where the parameter is inside the groups. No searching inside of here. So um, I think it's in identity data. And in fact, there it is. There's my identity type mark. So I'll add it in. Where do I want to group it? So I can, I have to look at that. Is it a type or an instance? I got to remember which one it is and click OK. That's added one. I think there was another four columns inside of that schedule. There could be another 20 columns inside of a, you know, um, um, a big equipment schedule. Um, I've got to do each of those individually. I can't do it for all of them that I need if I'm doing it manually. So it's very time consuming and very error prone. And it's basically just a horrible job to do. So I'm closing out of there. I didn't fix anything. <laughs> Go back to the lighting fixture schedule. You can see it's still not editable. I can't type in there. I'm clicking on my keyboard, nothing's happening. So to get it to work, I'll go to CTC. I've got my parameter jammer here. And over here, we can see a list of schedules. Up the top, we've got the shared parameter file. So I'm going to click the schedule that I want the things to work in. And you'll notice it shows the families that are in there. This one here, manufacturer's light fixture, 
is the one that I'm using that doesn't show up inside of the schedule. So I'm gonna go and hit next. It's gonna find the parameters required. And so that identity type mark and identity description, well, identity type mark is here. It's gonna add it as a type parameter. Uh, schedule description, it's gonna add it as a type parameter. You'll notice it also has options inside of here. So I could add it as type, I could add it as instance. I can also get it to replace existing data, if you like. So let's say we have a description inside of the family and the, um, the, the parameter in the family is called Philips description, because it's from Philips. Um, so data is inside of that parameter. I don't want to lose that data. I want to move that data over into my shared parameter. So I can actually pick it from the list here and it will not only add the shared parameter, but it will copy the information from the old parameter to the new shared parameter. So really cool functionality. I'm going to hit next. Once I've verified, I can hit next. And I didn't map any data, so I'm not going to get anything filled in here. Although actually, if we look at the lumens down and the volts, there's a chance I, nope, maybe, can't remember. <laughs> That's it, okay. Little report there at the end indicating what's happened. Okay, and so what we can then see here, oh, okay, is the objects disappear. Now that's actually a little bit of filtering I've got inside my project. Let me just fix that. So we've got schedule appears in as a type parameter. I've got a little bit of filtering on my project. Schedule appears in has to be set to LF, lighting fixtures, so that it shows up in that schedule. Let me just show you what I'm talking about in case that didn't make too much sense. In the filtering, I have a filter here which says schedule appears on equals LF. So if that isn't set, then, then that doesn't work. Now I've set it, I've again got my eight objects, but now you see I can type stuff in there. So if this is an S1, I can type that in. It's going to apply it to the filter, to the, the entire type. Now I've got my description. Maybe I can say, well, this is a one with four recessed. And I can fill that information in there. So now the data on the objects is able to show up in my custom company schedule, making it much more powerful and usable inside of my project. Hopefully that one, if nothing else, is showing you um, a tool that's just you know, project changing. <laughs> All right, let's move into the last one here, which is the project processor. Project processor can do a lot of things for you. It can do it to a lot of files at the same time. So this one can be a real big time saver. So over in the BIM batch suite, so these batch suite tools enable you to uh, process a lot of files at once. If I go into my project processor, the way this one works is I can assign it to one or multiple files. So I'll just remove that one for now. I'm gonna add the open project. So that's, okay, that's all of my open projects. <laughs> um, so I could do it on all of them. It might take a bit too long, so I'm actually just gonna uh, remove these ones. Okay, so I got my project processor RBT file. I have one open for each of my examples here. That's what's going on. Okay, if I switch over to the processes tab, You've got tabs on the left-hand side here for the different things that it can do. Now it's gonna run in the order that it finds them here. So for example, I've got my swap before my clean. What my swap will do is it will find um, incorrect object data and swap it with correct object data. So for example, on line styles, I could be looking for, um, yeah, ones that come in with wool. So maybe I'm bringing in a CAD file and I know that in the layer name, it's gonna have wall. So when I bring that in and explode it, it makes a line style with the name of the layer, right? I want that to be replaced by my line style for my project template, which is called four black solid. Similarly with line patterns, you get all a bunch of import ones. I wanna replace them with my company standard ones. Don't know if I have a, one of the nice name ones that I've made down. Oh no, these are line patterns. Getting confused with line styles. Okay, so my line patterns, I want to replace my import center with my center. So if I just add another one in here, what else? What's in this big long list of rubbish from imports? 
Okay, I'm going to go DCW. Maybe I'm bringing in some mechanical and I want to get rid of the DCW imports with one that I've already predefined in here for DCW. I'll put a wild card on the end there just to make it search for the multiple ones. And so it's going to swap them, right? But swapping happens before cleaning. The cleaning can then go in. If I go back to line patterns, as that's where we just were, this is going to remove any line patterns it finds that starts with imports. So as long as I've swapped them first, then I can clean them after. So you see there's uh, different things that can be done inside of here. On the links, I'm getting it to repath. So as I receive data from outside consultants, and I want to path it from their location to my location, perhaps, or maybe I'm doing a server change and I need to repath everything. Well, there's a simple tool inside of here that would allow you to repath your links. So maybe that's, um, I've got a bunch of links for uh, somebody's desktop, because that's where they save things. Yeah. Let's point it at the place it should be. Okay. Once you're ready to go, got your projects listed, you've got your processes in place that you're going to take care of, I can hit start. I will say there is also a purge one in here, which I would normally run, but it does take a little while to run the purge. I'm going to hit start. Confirming it's going to take a look at that open file, and it should only take a fairly short amount of time. Again, with these things that change files, you get a report at the end. So you can see it's changed the line style here. It's changed the it's changed lots of line styles. There we go. So it's found all of these different things in different uh, files in different places, different views. So we had an issue of a couple of um, repaths, but uh, yeah, that's the, the idea of this is it's a report indicating what's worked and what hasn't. It also indicates it's not saved the file, but it has finished processing it. Up here, you've got a bit of a filter. So I actually modified 4,300 things there. That's, that's good news. Um, if I turn those off, you can see just the errors if you want to know what it didn't do. Okay. Probably I just have some incorrect paths in there, I would say. As far as where I went to the links there, I was looking for a G old location and replace it with D new location. I don't think I actually have a G old location or a D new location. So um, that's why that I came up with a fail there. Okay, so that's process my project. If I was to go and take a look at something like my object line patterns, that's where I had all those imports. Okay, <laughs> what's it done there? Go line style, let's go. Hmm. There you go. There's an example of a line. Okay, that one has changed to the four black solid. And originally it was uh, one of the other line types. The the walls here, for example, that has been swapped out as well. Right. So um, very, very powerful, useful tool there. Okay. So I'm gonna switch back into my PowerPoint. And we will go from the current slide. And just check if there are any questions. I was keeping an eye on the Q&A as we went. I didn't see any questions pop up. But if there are, now's the time to ask. Okay, well, thank you very much for attending today. We really appreciate you coming to take a look at these new tools. And if you want to reach out to us and uh, ask any questions afterwards, please feel free to do so. And uh, thank you again for your time today. Yep, thank you. Thanks, Drew, for presenting all those tools. Um, that's, you know, uh, save you time doing tedious tasks within Revit, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending. And um, if you have any questions about um, the price, about licensing, trials, where to download them, you can reach out to both Drew and I, and we'll be happy to uh, help you out. Okay, goodbye. All right, take care, bye.